I'm going to call this sort of an accidental series. Even last week, I had a different idea of what I was going to preach on all week. And then at the last minute, it's like I had this pivot. And, it, and I ended up with a very unusual message. Uh, if you remember, it had a big black Newfoundland dog in it. And this week, sort of similar, where I was expecting to go in a different direction. And I feel like God keeps pressing me back into this zone and I'm not exactly sure if you said, so tell me what zone this is. Is this some kind of series? Well, I don't, I, it, there is. There's definitely a, a message sort of baked into this, but it doesn't quite say everything I'm feeling right now. There's, every now and then as a leader, I have this, where I sense that God is doing something, but I don't have language for it yet. Very frustrating, you know, because I love language, right? I want to articulate and define and circle it and say that that's what it is so so then I can tell you so you can at least be better prepared for what you're about to get and I feel like this is another piece of it and there there may be even another piece beyond this but I don't know maybe as I'm giving the message that other piece will just come in but it is a desire not to stay where I'm at and that isn't to say that where I am at is wrong And it's not to say that I don't love where I've been. For instance, this ministry, I love it the way it's been. And there's part of me that likes to bottle things up. I'm one of those guys that likes to wake up in the morning and do the same thing every day. Now, some of you are like, oh boy, one of those. I remember hearing about this basketball player named Carl Malone who played for the Utah Jazz. And he described his rhythm. He was this huge, hulking man, just very muscular. And you know, if you're a young guy, you're like, I want to look like Carl Malone. And so he was describing his life. He gets up at the same time, eats the same breakfast, you know, goes, drives the same route to work, shoots the same amount of hoops, you know, does his workout. And I was like, what a dream life. I love rhythm. I do. And yet, the same guy that loves rhythm I embrace the change that God brings to my rhythm. Even though when I get into a new season, I'm looking for rhythm. It's like, Lord, bring back my rhythm. At the same time, I've appreciated the fact that God has not allowed me to stagnate. Though I am a rhythm guy and though I like things predictable, God has consistently uprooted me from the predictable and moved me forward. And that is part of my favorite dimension of life, even though I still love the rhythm. And there is a certain rhythm that we get in every environment we're in. This is one of them, church. And there's some locals here, and you guys know who I'm talking about. It's all of us. And I'm not even a predictable pastor to start with, right? We do things all the time differently, and yet I still feel like we're in somewhat of a rhythm. And we could easily get stodgy. We could easily get coated with our barnacles of predictability. It's like, yeah, yeah, this is how we do it here. And if we did something completely different than that, it would be like, oh, whoa, wait a minute here. This isn't what I signed up for. And so much of Christian history is marked by God testing his children by saying, are you willing to follow me when I move? Because I'm not doing the old thing. I'm doing a new thing. And so if you remember last week's message, that's what it was about. And so in a strange sense, I'm going to take like my last three years And there are these different things. If you follow Daily Thunder, you're going to recognize certain things that are going to come out uh, in this that have been a part of different series that I've been a part of. It's like coalescing. It's like, yeah, like that. And so I don't know how to prep you for it any more than that. Let's just uh, sort of dive into it. The well-dressed admiral. So this guy, you can see the picture. If you're getting this via podcast, you can't appreciate the picture of it, but it's this very well-dressed admiral. And he's, I mean, you have to admit, I mean, this guy is snazzy. However, it's somewhat embarrassing that he's on a ship that is sinking. And when you're well-dressed and you sink, did you know that in war, there's actually a name for this? It is a phenomenon that takes place where uh, and I'll, I'll get into that, but this is the most embarrassing thing, to be well-dressed for war and then lose, or in this case, sink. Now, I know this might be too much of a giveaway of where I'm going with this, but imagine that we as the church get our act together and we dot every I, cross every T, and we look really good on the outside, but then we're sinking. It's somewhat embarrassing. It's sort of like being ready for war, or at least appearing to be ready for war, and then going down uh, in the sinking ship. It's like, wait, we're not supposed to be sinking as the church. We're supposed to be triumphing. 
So in war history, it's called the Sukumlinov effect. And I, I don't even know that I want to totally give away what the Sukumlinov effect is, because I will get to that. But basically, I'll give you a hint. It's the most well-dressed general always loses. That's like war history in a nutshell. If you as a general spend all your time looking good on the outside, it's almost guaranteed when you get to battle, you're going to lose. And it's like sort of a chuckle, uh, tee-hee type of a thing in, in war history where everyone just sort of looks and it's like, yeah, there it is again, the Sukumlinov effect. And what I don't want to be is the well-dressed general that just loses in this hour. I want to be the church triumphant. What does that mean? What does that look like? So in our family, we have a term called the fancy Leo principle. Now, a Leo, uh, a leotard, I know there's some of you in here that love wearing leotards, uh, that sort of is in the gymnastics realm, and Avi, my daughter, is in the gymnastics realm. So if it wasn't for Avi, believe me, I would not know about the fancy Leo principle. But here's the fancy Leo principle. There's nothing worse for a gymnast than to wear a fancy Leo where all the girls are like, oh, what a beautiful, pretty Leo. I've never experienced this, by the way. <laughs> and then to get on your beam routine and fall off the beam and then cry. And then everyone sees you in your fancy Leo crying. And from what I understand in gymnastics, that is the worst thing that can happen. If you're going to wear a fancy Leo, you need to act real fancy right? And you need to stick the beam routine. You can't fall off and start crying. So you, there's extra pressure when you have the fancy Leo on. Okay, the Ludi family, the reason we call it the fancy Leo principle is because we've had it crop up a few times. One of our little ones, uh, we'll just act like everything's way back in the past, uh, had some bunny ears on and got in trouble and forgot that they had bunny ears on. So they were on the fireplace hearth and, you know, some tears were streaming down the face and, you know, it was rather humorous looking. You know, when you have bunny ears on, you know, tears don't quite match. We had another little guy uh, who got dressed up as Davy Crockett and had a, you know, a makeup beard on and the whole Davy Crockett get up and then got in trouble with mama and had to sit on the hearth. And uh, it looked pretty funny where Davy Crockett was in trouble and sitting on the, and on the hearth. It didn't quite look like Davy Crockett, let me just put it that way. And that's sort of the fancy Leo principle. When you get, up, get dressed up like Davy Crockett, you want to act like Davy Crockett. You don't want to be in trouble and sitting on the hearth. The same is true with the church. If we get dressed up to showcase to the world Jesus Christ, we really want to do it well. We want to stick our beam routine. We really want to behave like Davy Crockett. We don't want our ship to sink. So I, some of you know Dave Sharman, uh, and if you know Dave Sharman, he is Australian, so he has the Australian accent. And so he was, I was in Starbucks, he was pulling through the drive-thru, and he saw me through there, and so he pulled around, came in. And I always love uh, talking with Dave. And Dave always has a great quote. And so Dave had a great quote, uh, and this is what it was. There are a lot of leaders today that are em empty netters. I know, that doesn't really help you, does it? You have to have a little context for that. And so I'm going to give you the context. And wow, did it fit in with what I was doing my sermon prep at the time. And it was like, where did Dave come from? Now he got into my message. And this is what he was referencing. John 21, 3 through 6. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. So Jesus is resurrected, but he's sort of like, not around. He's, he's sort of a mysterious character right now. And so we have this group that has been under the law, has seen the triumph of Jesus, but is still returning to their boats to go fishing. So I'm going fishing, says Simon Peter. Then they said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. There's a propensity for us to hold on to old ways or to return to old ways and cling to them. And Jesus comes around and says, other side of the boat, if you really want this to work, He's the master. These guys are really good fishermen, and yet they're empty netters. And how many of us 
can be leaders and influencers in the church, but throw our net to the predictable side that we, you know, we're well, well trained in this. We know what we're doing. And yet we need Jesus to say, new thing. You go to the side of the boat that I recommend, that's when you're going to find it. An empty netter, returning to an old trade, clinging to a past success, hearkening back to an old glory, refusing to adopt or to adapt to the new way, and fishing in the zone of a previous victory. I can't tell you how many denominations hang out in old zones. It's like this was their glory days. This is remember when God moved back in you know twenty three. And uh, well, I shouldn't, that was, that was 100 years ago, right? Uh, back in 1923, remember when God moved and he moved in such a powerful way? And so we want to recreate the setting for it. You know, I think I was standing right here. You were right there. Hey, let's all get into position again. And maybe God will do the same thing. God doesn't do the same thing. He does a new thing. And yet we tend to want the same thing. And yet God doesn't function that way. God does new things. The hippie movement. You guys ever heard of the hippie movement? It's a really funny name. Hippie? Isn't that funny? You just, even sounds weird. Sounds like you're sort of rebellious even when you say it. Hippie. It's like you have to have a snarl on your face when you say it. Hippie. And hippie is like the ultimate picture of rebellion. So here you have your old stodgy religious system and you're going to have the retaliation to it. And so the hippie movement falls into my new Daily Thunder series, which is between 1914 and 1974. So guess what's in there? The hippie movement, right? And there's this rebellion that is taking place to the existing religious system that had gone dead. And I think I have a picture. I mean, it was very colorful, you have to admit. Uh, very nice looking. Uh, and so I think, doesn't that sort of look like a painting? I don't know what it is, but it's a pretty cool picture. I like the color. However, this was a decadence that was rarely seen on earth. Whatever was moral, they did the opposite. And it was a complete throwing out of what was called the establishment. And in so doing, they didn't find truth by, by going against the old religious system. And yet, what is going to happen in that time period is you're going to see a availability or a readiness for this group that is now void of any moorings to actually return to Jesus, which is what's typically known as the Jesus revolution or the Jesus movement. So the hippies in church, do they even belong there? One of the thoughts that I've had uh, as I've been pondering that is how similar our culture is today to the way we were in the 60s, where there is a movement that is, we could call it anti-Christian. It might actually be better understood as anti-church. It's a system that we have. And as a church, we're really struggling to know how to be effective today. And so you see different churches trying, and it's like you see the ones that are becoming politically cool, and they know they're going to try and speak the language of the generation. So they're going to compromise and say, hey, let's throw out our standards and let's just welcome everyone in. So let's just be a social club where we hug each other. Well, that sounds a little like the hippie movement. At the same time, what are we supposed to do? Should we stay in our old way, fish on this side of the boat, or should we allow God to train us, to freshly reset us and say, God, what are we supposed to do today? Because I have a hunch that this mass of humanity out there that is so confused, whether it's in their worldview or in their gender, this mass is cr craving moorings. They are craving definition, something true, something real, but they've already tried the church. That's where they were hurt. So here we represent a generation that is coming in that we are the influencers. We're the ones caretaking for the gospel in this hour. What do we do? The same thing we've always done? Are we willing to go where maybe we've never gone before? I don't know. What does that look like? Well, I know it has to match the scriptures. That's what I was talking about last week. There's an ancient path, but on that ancient path, we need to be ready to sing a new song. So last week I talked about a character named Brumus. So do you remember Brumus? He was the famous Newfoundland. So here was my uh, picture from last week for my sermon. 
I just thought I needed an excuse. I never get to show previous pictures from sermons, so this gave me an excuse. It was called the Muddy Paws of Brumus. And there was an odd benefit of Brumus that I brought up last week, and that is that it exposes the religious spirit. One of the things I started with last week is I said, when you have an anti-Christian movement, or what we could call an anti-religious system movement, that enters into a culture, which is what we have today, we have a very anti-Jesus movement that is taking place. You know what it does for us? It's a great service unto our soul, is it exposes something, it just drives it to the surface, and that is our religion. Because we have old moorings, and some of it actually isn't what God wants us to be hanging on to. And so Brumus, he's symbolic of it, is going to drive this to the surface, and it's critical that we see it and, like dross, remove it from our life. So there's Brumus, a good-looking dog. So this was a story I gave last week of J. Edgar Hoover, who is the 70-year-old director of the FBI, probably should have retired. The 50s were his pinnacle of success, and he was really popular in the 60s. And from this point on, the way he's going to handle everything, he gets crotchety and old quickly. And he is not wanting to change. He's the old guard. He's the old system. He is the establishment. He is exactly what the hippies are rejecting, even in the governmental uh, situation. And then we have the new incoming attorney general, the brother of the president. So in 1960, uh, you're going to have the election of John F. Kennedy, and it's a major shift. The Kennedys want to bring something new. But what Bobby is going to bring into the Justice Department is like this rebellious spirit. So we have Hoover, who's the picture of the religious spirit, and we have Bobby, who's the picture of the rebellious. And it's quite the humor, as we explored last week. He's half the age of, of Hoover. And, and he's Hoover's boss. You imagine what that would have been like. So the first problem was Bobby's shirt sleeves, because everyone wore a suit, tie. You keep your tie on all the day. Everything's pressed. If you're going to be a good government worker, that's how you live. Bobby comes in, dressed fine. And then he removes his jacket. Did he just remove his jacket? I, just, I think he just removed his jacket. Rolls up his shirt sleeves, loosens his tie, unbuttons his top button. Hoover is beside himself. Can you believe he is doing this? Now, what, I did, can you even imagine what Hoover was thinking of the hippies? <laughs> if that was the beginning of it. Hoover had no grid for this. It's like how disrespectful to the government that he serves. Problem number two, the rumpus room. Well, Bobby didn't like the room that the attorney general typically was in, so he took the big reception area, which was about as big as this, turned it into his office, and they used to play football in it. And Hoover called it a desecration of government property. Now, which side are you on? We usually take one side or the other, and you know, some of us are, feel very much like Hoover and indignation towards this, but what the rebellious spirit is going to do is it drives out into the surface the ridiculousness of Hoover as well. Now, I'm not trying to promote what Bobby was doing either. And one of the things I, I said in summary is, this didn't work. This actually led to an explosion in the government because Hoover and Bobby could not get along. Problem number three was Bobby's random wanderings. He would just sort of wander. Well, you're supposed to set up appointments. There's a proper way of doing this. He'd just sort of walk in and check with people and talk with people. So Hoover was like stressed out all the time. It's like, you guys need to be always ready. If Bobby can, or if the attorney general comes, you need to be ready. Desk clean, tie, tie notched. You know, you need to be ready because he could come at any moment. Problem number four, the Hoover buzzer. He set a buzzer on Hoover's desk, and if it ever buzzed, he had to come immediately to Bobby. Uh, Hoover didn't like that buzzer. And problem number five, Brumus. Brumus, animals are not allowed in the White House. They're not allowed in the government buildings, the, the justice building. He brought his dog to work, and the dog would wander around and go to the bathroom in Hoover's office. And for most of us, we could get a really good laugh out of this because it is really funny. However, it was not funny to the religious guy. And that's much of what we are dealing with today is technically if we could take a step back and see a stodgy Christianity and this culture that is pressing against it, just almost like poking it with a hot poker saying, how are you guys going to respond to that? I know how you're going to respond. You're going to get mad at us. 
you see the hippie movement all over again, right now in this generation. So what we had in 1960 was something we could call toxic partisanship. That means like denominationalism. We are taking two sides. And it ruled our nation in 1960, and what was needed? Change. And so Bobby's going to come in and bring the change. However, Bobby was coming in with a rebellious spirit. That is only going to antagonize the other side of the equation. And so did this work? No. It was a disaster. So the answer was not found in either extreme. Hoover wanted to hold on to the glory of the 1950s. He refused to accept change. Bobby wanted to shove the new system down Hoover's throat and laugh while Hoover choked on it. And that's a pretty good description of not just that time, but our time. The religious spirit, this is how I described it last week, elevating the rule above the relationship. So remember my illustration of my family, uh, you know, that I have struggled with the religious spirit. Not that, I mean, I hate the religious spirit, but even I have like rules that I establish for myself. If someone's walking down the sidewalk and I'm in the way, I'll move out of the way. I'll show deference. Well, what if my family's in the way? And so I was giving the illustration of this family walking down, coming straight towards our family at Disneyland, and I shove my family off the sidewalk to allow this other family through. Suddenly my rule has trumped my care for my family. And I'm overruling my love and my care for my family so that I can show sensitivity to someone else or I can keep my rule. And that is when you know something has gone off. When you start hurting, hindering, harming the very people that you were called to care for because your rule is higher. And how many people have been harmed in church because of a rule that was kept? at the expense of the relationship that God desires us to have with the body of Christ. But then we have the opposite side, the rebellious spirit, where we elevate individualism above intimacy. When you are ele elevating individualism, that's rebellion. Where it's just like, this is the way I wanna do it, this is the way I feel, I don't care about your system, I don't care if this makes you uncomfortable, this is what I want to do. So instead of going after relationship, you elevate your way above anything else. So Hoover religiosity comes in many different packages in history, and here's one of them. This is, Vlad, this is General Vladimir Sukumlinov, and I'm going to describe him as a very well-dressed World War I Russian general. Do you guys remember something called the Sukumlinov effect? This is the host of that term. He's the sponsor of that very notion. He was extremely well-dressed. So listen to Barbara Tuckman uh, talk about him. Insofar as readiness for war was concerned, the regime was personified by its minister for war, Jennifer, yeah, Jennifer, sorry, if there's anyone named Jennifer, uh, General Sukumlinov. So this, he's a Russian, and this is in 1914. The Russians are not ready for war. And this is the reason why. We have this guy at the top, General Sukumlinov, an artful, indolent, pleasure-loving, chubby little man in his 60s of whom his colleague, Foreign Minister Sazanov, said, it was very difficult to make him work, but to get him to tell the truth was well-nigh impossible. Having won the cross of St. George as a dashing young cavalry officer in the War of 1877 against the Turks, Sukumlinov believed that military knowledge acquired in that campaign was permanent truth. As minister of war, he scolded a meeting of staff college instructors for interest in such innovations as the factor of firepower against the saber, lance, and the bayonet charge. He could not hear the phrase modern war, he said, without a sense of annoyance. As war was, so it has remained. All these things are merely vicious innovations. Look at me, for instance. I have not read a military manual for the last 25 years. How many of us pull off the same thing? It's called the Sukulinov effect, where we say... I, this is the way it's always been done. This is the way I've always done it. Look at me. I'm in a classic example. Chubby 60-year-old short guy, well-dressed, that is not prepared for the changes going on. World War I is going to bring a whole new level of warfare in that is going to shock the world. And if you're still leaning on the saber, lance, and bayonet charge, you're going to be blasted off the earth. You're not going to survive long. And the same can be true for us that we can struggle with the same odd thing. It's like, hey, this is the way it's always been. This is the way it was you know, for my granddad. This is the way it was for my father. And this is the way it is for me. Instead of allowing God to freshly ask us, hey, you catching any fish there? 
Well, you're not really. I mean, uh, people just don't seem to be really wanting uh, the type of bait I'm sticking in right now. Go to the other side of the boat. You see, Jesus has a solution, but oftentimes we get stuck because we're experts in fishing. We know how to do this. Barbara Tuckman continues, while Sukumlinov left work to others, he allowed no freedom of ideas. Clinging stubbornly to obsolete theories and ancient glories, he claimed that Russia's past defeats had been due to mistakes of commanding officers rather than to any inadequacy of training, preparation, or supply. With invincible belief in the bayonet's supremacy over the bullet, he made no effort to build up factories for increased production of shells, rifles, and cartridges. No country its military critics invariably discover afterward is ever adequately prepared in munitions. That's ammunition. Military unreadiness ruled Russia in 1914. Change was needed. And yet they're not going to change because look who's at the, uh, the head. It's the same with Hoover in 1960, is you're going to have this same effect throughout history. I mean, you could look at any nation and see this same propensity, just like you can stare at the church and go, huh, well, that's fascinating. When the Pharisees are in charge of the religious system, when Jesus comes along, they don't realize they need to change. The new thing has come, and they are not prepared for a new thing. The answer was not found in either extreme. Sukumlinov wanted to hold on to the old glory of 1877. He refused to accept change. The Bolsheviks wanted to shove the new system down Sukumlinov's throat and laugh while Sukumlinov choked on it. The Bolsheviks, you would know them as communists, are going to take control of Russia and it's going to become the Soviet Union in 1917 as a direct result of Sukumlinov's unreadiness. And so we see a shift. We go from hyper-conservative Sukumlinov to hyper-liberal, the, the Soviets. And so you have this swing that takes place when the middle ground is never realized. It's like, let's adapt, let's change, as is reasonable. The Sukumlinov effect. In history, this is what it, what it is. Wars are lost by the side that wears snappier uniforms. I mean, that is, it's just a funny statement throughout war history. So if someone really dolls themselves up and looks really cool on the outside, they inevitably are going to lose the war. And, or as we call it, uh, the fancy Leo principle. You don't want to fall off that beam with that fancy Leo on. Matthew 23, 5 through 6. But all their works they do to be seen by men. Who? Well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, as Jesus is clarifying here. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogue. Jesus has arrived on the scene. What are the Pharisees and Sadducees even there for? What is their entire goal? It's to actually prepare the people for the arrival of this one known as the Messiah. And yet when that Messiah comes and is ready to show them how to fish right now in a new way, they crucify him. You see, they were putting their emphasis in what they looked like on the outside. I mean, talk about a fancy Leo. Talk about the Sukumlinov effect right here. They make their phylacteries broad. So a phylactery is going to be, it's like a little, little leather case that you actually bind on your forehead and around your left arm near your heart. So your head and your heart are showing your, the value of the law. And there's very specific scriptures that they had on little strips of parchment in these so that when they were living their life, when they were doing their praying, they would remember the law. But what is the law showing them? Ironically, their need for Jesus. And so they were focused on the exterior so much that they took their phylacteries, which are usually about this big, and they made them huge. So they have these huge phylacteries to make clear to everyone that they take this more seriously than ever anyone else. And guess what? It's like the sinking admiral who is well-dressed. That when Jesus comes, the very ones who are supposed to promote his arrival are the very ones sinking in their ship. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be the one assigned with the gospel. And I do everything exteriorly correct. And then... In my fancy Leo, sink. I don't know if you really want to envision Eric Ludi in a fancy Leo. In my admiral's getup, I sink. To remain in an old glory is to prepare to lose 
and lose badly. Now, this is very common all throughout history. Just like you see Sukumlinov, he's living in an old glory, 1877. We did it in my day with lances, sabers, and the bayonet charge. And guess how Russia is going to start in World War I? Guess how France is going to start in World War I? They're going to start with a bayonet charge. The Germans are going to mow them down with machine guns. I mean, it is so inhuman what is going to happen in the very begin, be, beginning of World War I because these countries are hanging on to their traditions the way that they've always done it. And I, what I want to learn from this is I just want to say, Lord Jesus, I want to move when you move. When you say step forward, I want to step forward. I don't want to pull a Sakumlin off. I don't want to just justify that just because I was strong back in this day and that you moved when I did this back in this day, that your function in the same expectation of me today, I want to follow, yield. I want to know what you have for me. So to remain in an old glory is to prepare to lose and lose badly. The well-dressed French in 1914 is a case in point. So I couldn't get a really good picture of it because you get a black and white picture when you go back to 1914. So you can't quite see it. Every other country has come to the conclusion that camouflage is essential in battle. I mean, I don't know if you've ever studied camouflage. You understand why camouflage could be important. So that you don't stand out when some sniper is looking for someone to shoot. However, the French believe that is wimpy. It's lacking manliness. And so they are going to go to the opposite extreme, and they're going to put plumes. They're going to have white gloves. Everything that would say, hey, look at me, because we do not fear your bullets. Well, uh, that's going to change uh, not far into World War I because they got mowed down. I mean, it's a disastrous story for the French when it starts out. But this is how they're going to start out. The best dressed in war are going to lose. They're going to fall off the beam and cry in their Leo. And it's not a pretty sight, guys. To remain where the cloud once was, but isn't anymore. Remember the Israelites? This is what I talked about last week. The cloud... Cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. When the cloud moved, they moved. When the cloud stayed, they stayed. But when the cloud moves and you stay where it once was, it's like, no, the cloud used to be here a long time ago. This is, this is where I, I, I met God in a powerful way. I saw him work miracles here and beneath the cloud. Yeah, but there's no cloud anymore. What happens when the cloud moves and you're in the hot desert and you no longer have a cloud? Well, not only are you not with the cloud, but you don't have the shade that that cloud once produced. And so now you're not doing so hot. So, is, so listen to this line. To remain where the cloud once was but isn't anymore is to prepare to roast and roast badly. The Pharisees hold on to the law. So, I mean, they have their phylacteries. It's all broad. They're, they're making their statement. We hold on to the law. We value the law. When Christ is in their midst, ready to free them from the very condemnation the law exposed. The irony of this is outrageous. That these people that are holding on to the law and even crucifying the Son of God. When you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you have the religious spirit and you have the rebellious spirit all in one. Neither one of them are the solution. And both of them crucify the Son of God. The well-dressed church of today... Doctrinally sound. There's some churches out there that are very doctrinally sound. Organizationally excellent. There's some churches out there that are very organizationally excellent. We have a lot of books, a lot of teaching on this today. Financially together, we have some churches out there that are excellent, completely out of debt, own their building outright. I mean, it's very impressive. And sinking like a well-dressed admiral. What's the good of having it all together and being dead? At the very moment that God has commissioned us to bring in a harvest if we're not even ready to bring in a harvest because we're so focused on the system and making sure the system is well-dressed. For me, this is a tension because I don't see any reason why I should go the opposite. Oh, let's be doctrinally unsound. Let's be organizationally a mess and let's be financially upside down. Well, that's not the solution either. However, any more than I would say, yeah, I don't want you to be well-dressed in your life and that's the new principle we all live by. 
It's just that when you emphasize exterior over interior, that's when you get off. I don't think that God is trying to diminish the exterior and say, yeah, don't wear anything. I mean, then we'd be in a totally different problem. The issue is, if we are sinking, why? And are we emphasizing the right things? You see, I am a big fan of all three of those things, and I would not want to throw them out and say the opposite would be more true. But Jesus is saying, children, have you caught anything? How's your church doing? Are you growing? Are people coming to know you? How are you caring for this lost world? Is the world reviving? How are you doing? I, not very good on those fronts, but I mean, hey, we had a really good time in the boat. We sang some good songs and, you know, and uh, had a good Bible study here and really doctrinally sound. It was, it's a totally paid for boat. We own it outright. But children, have you caught any fish? Uh, no, not, uh, not really. You ready to? What if I said, take your net and put it on the other side? Do a new thing. Well, we're really good fishermen, and this is the side. This is my favorite side. This is the way it's always worked, and I've really caught great fish, great catches from this side in the past. But you're not catching any now, right? Well, no, but that's beside the point. I think if I just keep it here long enough, maybe the fish will find their way into my net again. Other side. Revelation three seventeen through 19. Now, this is the church of Laodicea. If you're familiar with uh, the seven churches in the book of Revelation, you know that Laodicea is not really the one that we want to be. And yet, I have to admit, as I meditate upon it, that I really do feel that the modern church has a kinship with Laodicea. And that isn't because I'm just wanting to you know, throw a dart at the modern church. I just want to be honest with where we're at. Children, are you catching any fish? Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. You consider yourself, O church, well-dressed, but I'm wanting to tell you, you're naked. I want to give you clothing. I want to dress you, unlike you've ever been dressed before. But you're going to have to acknowledge something. The system you have right now is actually not working. Leaven. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? You ever heard of leaven in the Bible? And now this is sort of a trick question because... Most of us are going to default to a certain answer on this one, but I'm setting you up for something on this because leaven is what we could call a change agent. When you, when you stick it inside of that, uh, that dough, it is going to alter the state of that dough. So I have two scriptures for you, both uh, going to be key in answering this question. Matthew 16, 6, Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So obviously, if I said, is leaven good or bad? You say, whoa, well, we don't want that because the, Ser the Ph Pharisees and the Sadducees, if we could say the spirit of rebellion and the spirit of, uh, of religion, if you were to agree with either of these, they're going to change the way you live. They're going to alter the way you function. But then Matthew 13, 33 says, another parable Jesus spoke to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. You see, there is a change agent. It's the Spirit of God that wants to enter in and lead us. But the Spirit of God does not just hug us where we're at. He compels us to move in a new direction. He will alter our life. He will change us. It's called sanctification. But are we willing to agree with that right now as the church? Not just as individuals, because we have to first appropriate this as individuals. Am I willing to allow God to enter my life and to change my life? Are we willing to allow the Spirit of God to enter our church and to change our church? To lead us maybe where we've never gone before? A very different approach. K 
King Alfred the Great. You guys remember him? Now, you to, if you've been hanging around with uh, Eric, you know, I, talk, I had a whole series on King Alfred a couple years ago, really powerful series called Spiritual Lessons from Alfred the Great. So Alfred is, uh, there, there's a, a bust. You can't get a good photo of Alfred. Look at the time in which he lived, 848 to 899 AD. No photographs back then, right? So you had to sort of squint and use your imagination of what the guy looked like. Great man, King Alfred the Great of Wessex. Now, where is Wessex? So if you, uh, oh, that's not, uh, there, okay, I'll come back to that other picture. So you'll see, this is called Britannia, and it was called a heptarchy. It was broken into seven different components, and you'll see Wessex down in the bottom uh, left there. So uh, Alfred ruled that. His father ruled that, and then his brothers all died, and he inherited that, that kingdom, and he is ultimately going to be the one responsible for uh, driving out the Vikings. The Vikings actually at one point in time had taken over the island of what we know as Great Britain. And he is going to be the one to fight back, push them off, and ultimately establish England. So what we know as modern England or Great Britain is a result of this man known as Alfred the Great. Oh, let me go back to that one slide. Okay, the third system. So in Alfred's day... There was a system of military arrangements of how he fights his wars. His dad's 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 dad had this, and it's been passed down for generation to generation, and he is inheriting. It's called the third system. I will explain what the third system is, even if you don't care, you'll find out. And this is the way it's always been done. When it comes to church today, have you ever know that notice that we have the same type of a thing? Well, this is the way it's always been done. It's actually really difficult to do church differently. We had a whole movement called the Emergent Movement uh, that came into Christianity uh, you know, 15 years ago that was altering the way church was done. And there were people that were really into this. And so they had you know, labyrinths, prayer labyrinths. They had you know, lotus position, like meditation type of stuff. It's like borrowing from uh, Eastern mysticism, a whole bunch of new age stuff, bring it into the church. And I'd be like, Okay, I'm interested in God changing us, but I'm not interested in borrowing from the world and saying, oh, if we could just be more like the world, then maybe we'd be more effective with the world. The secret of Christianity has been that we have the one solution for a dying world. To have a solution for the world, you can't be like the world. You can't lead them away from their lifestyle if you are sharing in it. And so for us as the church, we have to know our role in this. But that doesn't mean we keep fishing on this side of the boat. And it does not mean we violate the word of God in doing it. We just need to know how God wants us to win this battle. When David showed up to fight Goliath, you fought with armor, sword, and shield. And guess what? He takes it off. He says, I haven't proven those. And he picks up five smooth stones and he changes warfare. That's what I want to do. I want to change warfare where we need to change it. Why? Because God is our commander in chief. If he says, set down that armor, I want you to pick up five smooth stones. Use faith as your armor today. All right, don't know what that looks like, but you got it. So the third system. Military unready, uh, unreadiness ruled Wessex in 885. Change was needed. We have a significant issue in 885, and I know some of you don't really have a lot of care for Alfred. If you listen to my series, you know, some of you are like upset because I'm skipping so far into the series. Like, whoa, you're like skipping all that and just bringing it right to 885? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. But change is needed because the third system does not work. The Vikings are ruling over the country because of this crazy third system, even though it's always worked up to this point. So let's describe uh, that. The Saxon soldiers weren't being bested in their shield wall. They were being bested in how long it took to build their shield wall. So the way the ancient Saxons, which is what someone living in Wessex would have been called, is they overlapped their shields and they would man to man, shoulder to shoulder, and they would fight against uh, any opponent. And they were, it's an amazing military maneuver to, to fight with a shield wall. Very fascinating to study. We're not going to talk about that. And yet it wasn't that their shield wall wasn't a good idea. It's sort of like us with truth. Well, the gospel doesn't seem to be working. No, it could be how you're delivering. It could be how you're living the life behind your delivery of the gospel. Don't throw out the shield wall. It's, they, they would take two weeks to get their shield wall together. Two weeks. So the Vikings come in. It doesn't take two weeks for the Vikings to plunder a city. It takes them half a day. 
And by the time the, the third system is called, you know, called all the different warriors together, two weeks later after the Vikings were there, they show up and go, what, what do you guys need? Uh, we needed you two weeks ago. And that's the third system. It was not working. And yet that's the only thing anyone ever knew. So Dr. Merkel, in his book, The White Horse King, said it this way, whenever the king of Wessex needed to gather an army to fend off an enemy invasion, it was necessary that he assembled the third a voluntary ad hoc militia. The numerous landowning noblemen of Wessex, the earldom of who commanded the loyalty of the local farmers and craftsmen of the individual shires, held the third together. These elder, eldermen ruled the shires on the king's behalf, enforcing the rule of law, ensuring that taxes were gathered, and preparing the shires to defend themselves in case of attack. Each elderman had the ability to summon a third from his shire, a force numbering up to several thousand men. Then, when a national emergency arose, the king would call his eldermen, along with their shired firds, creating one large national fird, numbering as many as 10,000 men. But there was a clumsiness and inefficiency to this system as well. First, this was not a standing army. This was a force that had to be summoned for each individual action, a process that could take weeks to complete. Armies that moved and struck swiftly, like the Viking raiding armies, had way too much time to advance untouched. So if you find yourself in a situation, which is what I feel like as a leader, I am looking at a movement in our world to sabotage the truth. And I feel like we are a cumbersome lot as the church. It's like, even to get together with other leaders to go, hey, uh, maybe we should pray about what we should do. Oh, that's going to take months. We are a cumbersome lot. We're like a third system. I mean, even at Ellerslie, if you talk to Nathan Phillip and I, and it's like, okay, uh, let's get a meeting together to talk about how we could rearrange Ellerslie and come up with a new plan in the years to come. It's like, all right, what does your schedule look like? Yeah, that's going to be a couple months before we could have that meeting. Very re it's the reality of what we're dealing with. We have a lot on our plate already. It's like a third system. We are not dexterous and able to move and adjust quickly to a Viking invasion. Lord Jesus I feel in need. I feel like this growing evil in our culture. I feel like the young people of today are so confused. And we do not, as the church, have an easy voice or an easy access to them. And so we're seeing the effects of it, but we don't know how to intercept before they get infected. So we're dealing with a problem that we don't know how to stop happening. And I would just say, Lord, I know you care, and I know this is your territory, so I've been fishing a long time, and I've caught a lot of fish in my life, but Lord, I'm willing to relearn it all. And this is my statement, willingness to change everything. This is my statement to my soul. I've said it to my wife. I've said it to my kids time and again over these past months. If I need to shut down Ellerslie, I will. If I need to redo everything that we do at Ellerslie, I will. If we need to move to Zimbabwe, we will. What God wants as his solution, and his strategy for this hour, I say yes. Whatever that is, because I do not want to be fishing and get an empty net. I got one life, one shot, and I don't want to stick in my religion and my system and my glory of yesteryear and catch nothing today. So, a willingness to change everything. And this is what Alfred is going to go through. It's like, hey, I could either lose Wessex or we could change this system. You know how the elderman really struggled with Alfred changing this? It's like, this is the way it's always been. This is tradition. This is the way our system, this is Wessex. This is our heritage. And it's always won us our battles. And Alfred said, we're changing it. And he created something known as the Burr system. Don't you love these old words? Furred and Burr. And, and look how it's spelled. B-U-R-H. looks like Burr. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Merkel says it this way. To quickly field an army large enough to fend off the Viking armies, Alfred could no longer rely on the sluggish response of the traditional Furred. Instead, he would need to maintain a large standing army of soldiers skilled in warcraft who were ready to respond to an invading army at a moment's notice. Wouldn't that be quite the thing for the church that we could actually respond to the enemy at a moment's notice? 
We are very sluggish in our response to things because we are so busy. Same with them, they were all farmers. If you're a farmer, you're tending to your crops and your home, and if you get called to war, you know what a big deal that is? You have to get someone to come in and maintain your fields while you're gone. This is why it takes so long. You have to get your things in order before you can leave town. It is not a quick thing. It's like, do, do, do. You know, it's like, okay, all right, they need me. Honey, uh, I need to get things in order. We need to find someone to take care of our farm. Could you imagine all of Wessex needing to do that? And so this is not an easy thing, and that's the way many of us feel as well. The burr system, it is built in the season in between. Alfred is going to have this extraordinary victory, which is hard to describe, but it involves a character named Guthrum, but I don't want to give much away. And there is peace, peace that he has never tasted in his entire life. And the Vikings have stepped back, but he knows they're going to return again. Have you ever had one of these seasons where it's just like, oh, reprieve. I, we're in it right now, guys. We are in a season in between. Most of you understand that the enemy isn't done, that there is a movement ahead that is going to strike even harder against everything we represent. But we are in a season where we can rebuild. We are not in an underground shelter trying to figure out how to redo an underground system of Christianity. We are in a system of remodeling, of remaking what we need to be so that we can be strong for the, the world in which we live to bring the gospel to bear upon it. So the birth system was built in that in-between season. So here's, I'm going to try and explain this. It's actually really fun. First, Alfred divided the third system into two parts. Remember his third system? So he has all of Wessex. He's going to divide all the fighting men, which was, let's just say 10,000. He's going to divide it into two parts, 5,000 over here, 5,000 over here. Third one were the fighting Saxons. Third number two were the farming Saxons. And then he created a calendar of 60-day rotations when Ferd one would switch positions with Ferd two. When Alfred yelled, rotate, which there's no evidence historically that he yelled, rotate. I'm, I'm saying that. But when he yelled, rotate, the fighting Saxons would become farming Saxons and the farming Saxons would become fighting Saxons. Therefore, there was always enough men to farm and there were always enough men to fight. Then Alfred strategically divided up the fighting Saxons into two parts and placed them in strategic locations all throughout Wessex. So he has, remember, 5,000 fighting Saxons. So now he's going to break those up into two parts. And so fighting Saxons, we're going to call them Fizz. So uh, we have Fizz 1 and Fizz 2. The Fizz 1, the Wessex Wandering Warriors, these are my names if you're wondering if they were this creative back in those days. We'll call them the Triple W. The Wessex Wandering Warriors, the Triple W moved about on horseback, slept in fields, and were able to travel to any point of need in the country within days and engage in war at a moment's notice. Wouldn't this be interesting if you had a Fizz 1 and a Fizz 2 in your life too? That you had a part of your life that was dedicated to readiness and a part of your life that was dedicated to making sure certain things were always protected because that's what the Fizz 2 are. The big boys of the Burrs, the Triple B. Isn't that a cool name too? The Triple B. The Triple B were assigned to one of 30 burrs throughout the territory of Wessex and were ready to defend their assigned burr at a moment's notice. So what Alfred is going to build is burrs. Now, I haven't described what a burr is yet, but he's going to take the 30 most strategic city locations in all of Wessex, and he's going to turn them into burrs. I know. Or burr. Huh. And he is going to armor them so that Half of these fizz were actually there already on location. These are the spots the Vikings are going to hit. He already has an army that is there, and then he has another army that is sleeping in fields ready to go right where the Vikings hit. Now, what is a burr? It's a city that has been clothed in armor. It's interesting because this whole message is about being well-dressed, but it's being well-dressed in the wrong way. What's the good of being a well-dressed Sekumlinov or an admiral while your ship is sinking? What we are looking for is being well-dressed in a way that causes us not to sink. And that is called the armor of God. And what we're going to see with these burrs is they're going to be clothed in armor. 
Benjamin Merkel says it this way, Alfred ordered that each of these 30 cities be fortified with a defensive wall capable of withstanding an assault by Danish attackers. The construction, those are the Vikings. The construction of these defenses transformed a selected city into a burr, the Anglo-Saxon word for a fortified dwelling. Many English towns still carry the remnants of this designation of their names. The suffix is burr or bury. So if you've ever heard those like Pittsburgh, that would be a burr. That's actually what the term, where it came from. Indicate their former classification as an ancient burr. A deep moat and a newly constructed wall encircling the city defended each of the 30 burrs. So remember your old school picture of like a castle and then a moat? Yeah, that's what Alfred's going to invent. So everything you remember in the storybook understanding of England with its castles and its moats, that's what Alfred is building. He's building these into burrs. We know them as castles with moats, right? But that's basically what they were. So there is actually one of the burr walls. Uh, and so it wasn't a small thing. And this is what he's building. What are we building in this season? Are we fortifying ourselves to be effective in battle against the movement of the enemy so that we can effectively win the hearts and minds of a lost and dying generation. Dr. Merkel says it this way, Alfred's innovations in organizing the garrisons that would defend the fortified cities of Wessex constitute probably the greatest administrative accomplishment of his reign. First, the king carefully selected 30 Wessex cities to receive garrison forces from the rotating third. Each of these cities was positioned within around 20 miles or one day's march of one another, forming a network of fortified cities that covered the extent of Wessex. And everything is going to change. Everything about modern warfare is totally altered because of Alfred's invention. One of the desires I have, guys, is that we are effective today. I, you know, when Dave Sharman says so many leaders today are empty netters, what? I don't want to be an empty netter. That may be true, but Lord, may it stop here. I don't want to be a guy that throws my net over the way I always have and just hopes for the same result that I've always had instead of saying, God, what's your strategy? I believe you are the better fisherman than me. So Lord, if you want me to change my method, my way of doing it, my answer is yes. How might this affect you or me? Are you like ancient Wessex and in need of a new military system? Does it often take you weeks to acknowledge you are wrong and to confess your sin? Just imagine the Vikings make a move on your soul. Does it take you weeks to finally get to that spot and say, okay, that, that was wrong? <laughs> That's probably not the best defense mechanism that you have in your life is to wait a couple weeks till, you know, sort of simmers down and the Vikings have already plundered everything and then finally acknowledge, yeah, that was probably wrong that I let the Vikings in. Is your soul lacking a wall about it and therefore it's easy for the enemy to affect your mood, impact your thoughts, distract you from Christ and plunder your spiritual gains? God wants you to have armor around your soul so that the enemy can't just come in and affect your day. The enemy is very good at changing your mood, your attitude, if you are pliable to it. But if you have a burr system around it, it's like, no, this is one of my 30 spots. The enemy tries to hit these. I'm walled in in that territory, very watchful. I have a watchman on the wall. Ah, I know what he's doing. No, I'm not gonna let you affect my mood and my attitude. No, oh, I'm not gonna let you irritate me towards that one person in my life the way you always have. No, no, we're going to actually bring fortification in here. Are you allowing the enemy to kidnap precious peace because you are not taking your thoughts captive to the will of Christ Jesus? Does your furred resolve to fight fade too quickly when a long siege occurs? Back in those days when they had the furred system, imagine if the Vikings are moving through the land and your territory was just conquered. Well, what would happen is all of these soldiers would depart from the army to go back and protect their families. Because now the, the Vikings are moving through. Well, they just like overran their territory. So all, it kept losing people. So they'd start with 10,000. And by the time they're in the corner of, of Wessex, they'd have 500 left. Because everyone else is trying to tend to their families because the Vikings overran them. It's like, this is chaos. This isn't working. Are you constantly distracted from fighting your king's battles due to the cares of this life? I'm a farmer. How am I supposed to be a good farmer if the Vikings are striking the territory and they keep blowing the bugle for me to come to war. I can't do both and. God has commissioned us 
to do both and. But what we need is a burr system. We need to allow God to build us for the day in which we live. Our grandparents may not have fought Vikings. We are. We're dealing with a movement that is very unique today. We live in a culture that is very unique today. You can't just say, oh, this is just like, you know, 75 years ago. Well, the spiritual attack is, but the way it is happening is unique. Sometimes we even hate our old patterns, but cling to their predictability. You ever notice that? It's like we hate the third system in our life, but hey, this is the way we've always done it. And so it's predictable when we hold on to it. Church, that's a great description of church. It's, it's really weird, guys. At Ellerslie, I see this all the time. People will, like the students will be in here and we will have a movement of grace where people will be on their face. There's a softness, there's a laughter, there's a, it's like a looseness almost, I could call it. And then Sunday mornings, everyone gets more stiff. And I've brought that up in this chapel so many times and it's not, you know, some of you are like, uh, how do I not be stiff? I mean, I mean what, what do you do? I don't have the solution for it other than I know that there's a churchiness that comes over us. I don't know, churchiness. I don't want churchiness. I don't want churchiness in my life. I want the sort of environment that anyone in this world that has never experienced Christ at all could enter into this environment and they would receive an overwhelming flood of love. They would see joy on our faces. They would sense that there is life in our community together. Whoa. I can't like force that. It's like, you're going to be happy today. And if someone comes in, you're going to swallow them up in a hug. Well, I've never actually given a hug before. Well, you're going to start. It isn't how we move people. It isn't how I should lead. This is a God work. It starts with us realizing that we're empty netters. It doesn't mean we're not trying to fish. It doesn't mean we're not intentional that we're desirous to do the work of God. It just means that we need to be honest about what we're bringing in. And if we're not effective in our working today and the world is getting worse and we're not helping it go in a different direction, then we should say, Lord, are you just happen to be on the beach there? Because I could really use some tutoring from you. The secret to Alfred's armor, his willingness to do something new, his willingness to let go of an old way, his willingness to relinquish what once worked. Wise saying. Isn't that a funny scripture reference for it? Wise saying. The will of God is the safest place on earth. Now, I don't know who first said that, but I've heard that in, in missionary training that is always one of the classic lines that will come up. Because you, where God calls us is not always safety. And we're like, oh, I'm going to bring my family into that? And this is the statement that comes out. The will of God is the safest place on earth. When we are walking with the cloud we are safe. When we follow him, we are safe. We're secured in his purposes to fulfill his purposes. So change it. Change it all. If there is a weakness, do what it takes to fix it. If you recognize the enemy is overwhelming your life, then get dressed in some armor, guys. Change your lifestyle. Change the way. If, if it's like, Every time you sit down at your computer, you have a tendency to do, and you fill in the, the gap. Whether it's a distraction, whether it's a sensual uh, turn, change it. If what you're doing is leading you to sin, get rid of that. Alter it. If you're getting to bed too late and you start to have issues later at night and you don't have the sense of accountability because people are asleep, go to bed earlier. If you need to be getting up in, in the morning so that you have more focus and you have more time just to lay a groundwork for your day, then do it. And don't blame it on the fact that you are a night person or a morning person or, or switch it. We try and personality lead our life and say, well, this is not who I am. This is not the way I've ever been. Whatever is going to be helpful is what you're willing to do. Change it. Change it all if necessary. We want to be used by Jesus. We got one shot at this thing. Whatever it takes, let's be available to it. Alfred's four for one coin exchange. This is, he's going to change everything in this culture, every single thing. And it's a pretty remarkable story, guys. He is going to bring this country back to Jesus. He was a strong Christian man. That was his influence for all of these changes. He is going to command all of his people to turn in their coins. They had a really cheap coin. It was a silver coin. 
and it had a little small amount of silver in it. And so it was worthless almost, but that's all they had. He's going to say, give it to me and I'm going to remake our coin system. And they would give four pennies, if you call it pennies, and they would get one back. But that one they got back was pure. And at first it looked like a terrible deal. How would you feel if you, if, you know, God says, yeah, could you give me all of your coins, everything you have, and I'm going to give you back something better. It's like, you're giving me one. Yeah, but that one is going to become the most expensive piece of money in the world at that time. Alfred is going to build an economic system that is going to change the world. But the way to find it is you have to first let go of your little insignificant pennies. This is hard for all of us, but this is the gospel. You want to have life, you need to give up the little life you have. You want capital L life, give up your lowercase l life. At first, it looks like a rotten deal. Kingdom of heaven is never a rotten deal. But what looks highly unattractive at first can turn into the world's greatest investment opportunity. John 21, three through six. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come now, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Are you tired of being an empty netter? Jesus said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So I can't speak for where you're at and how you're appropriating this, but one thing I know from a leader's vantage point is I just want to hold everything I'm doing loosely. And I want to say, Lord, I want you to improve this. I want you to make me uncomfortable where I need to be made uncomfortable. I want you to move us forward out of our staleness. I don't want to sink in our well-dressed garb. I want to thrive. So God, what do you want to do here? What do you want to do to change the world? Are we bringing in a lot of fish? I mean, the influence of this ministry is worldwide. So we could say, oh yeah, we, we've, we've brought in a lot of fish. And yet I ache. I feel more like the disciples here, like I'm fishing and I'm not really getting what I know I'm supposed to be getting. I don't want to try and justify and say, hey, look, I, I caught a fish once. I, I want to say, Lord, you are a great fish catcher. And I don't think I'm showcasing through my life your ability to catch fish at the level you intend to catch fish. So Lord, I for one want to acknowledge that I'm not catching what I'm supposed to catch. Start right here, Lord. Father, I ask that you would work a miracle in our lives and that you would move us out of our comfort zones, that you would expose that religion that holds us back and you would also not allow us to swing to the rebellious where we start rejecting the system just because it sounds stale or feels stale. But we would remember that, Lord, you chose the church as your medium of operation. This is your revelatory instrument. So Lord Jesus, may we walk an ancient path, but may we sing a new song. We ask this in the name of Jesus, amen.